Hello, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. So it's my distinct pleasure today to introduce uh, Mr. Mike Hoffman. Uh, perhaps you've seen his bio. Um, he's been many places, NDU, and now he's at CNA. Um, but maybe the most important fact you should know about him is he was sitting in your seat a couple years ago. Um, SSP alum obviously has gone on to do amazing and wonderful things, and we're super lucky to have him here today. He's going to tell you all about uh, Russian Armed Forces. So without further ado, let's turn it over to him. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to be back. It has indeed been a couple of years, I think maybe 12 or more. Uh, my goal today is to try to give a, a overview of the evolution of Russian Armed Forces. Of course, it's going to be a bit cursory. It's a long story. It's an interesting story. The challenge was always where to start. If we had more time, I'd probably start at the end of World War I and the beginning of sort of the Red Army. Right, take us to World War II or to the Cold War. Don't quite have that much time today, so I'm going to start really around early to mid-1980s, take us to the last period of the Soviet Union, and into Russia and the Russian military today. Hopefully save some good time for questions, and basically my goal is to start a conversation, right? And have an exchange with you, not a, hopefully not just to talk at you. So, I'll give you a bottom line up front, right? In case uh, this lecture gets long. Yeah, the, the gist of the Russian military, at least my sense, is that it's fundamentally and historically been a military culture that really does well at operational art and focuses on the operational level of war. U.S. discussions of it, tactical, operational, strategic, are not necessarily discrete levels, but the Russian military thought they tended to be. And the Russian military has always really done pretty decently on strategy, a pretty good operational level of war. It's historically been pretty weak at the tactical level, right? And that's often why it's taken great casualties, both in defense and offense, when it comes to conflict. That said, for numbers, weaknesses, and shortcomings, I'll discuss some of them through this presentation, the Russian military has done very well historically against other forces that were technically tactically stronger, but operationally and strategically not quite, not quite as prudent or smart. And the conversation I want to have here today is talk a bit about <laughs> Russian military thought and the evolution of it from the late period of the Soviet Union, how it was interrupted by the collapse of the Soviet Union, the sort of delusion period of divestment of the Russian armed forces, and then the military reforms modernization process that took place in 2008-2011, and the restoration of military power as a useful instrument of Russian national power after that period, and lessons from recent conflicts. So, um, without further ado, First, part of this lecture will definitely focus on military thought. Why? Because a lot of lectures on Russian armed forces focus on gear and on technology, and we already have a huge technology fascism culture problem in the United States to begin with. So we'll talk a bit about military thought and a bit about people, though I promise we're going to get into modernization and reform as well in this conversation. All right. So in late 1970s, early 1980s, Soviet Union was having these really interesting discussions on modern character of war, and uh, it was falling closer to what was happening in the United States. To the 70s, the United States and Soviet Union kind of had established a mutual suicide pact, right? Where they had matched each other uh, in terms of nuclear arsenals at sort of tactical and theater and strategic levels, and conventional forces were relatively balanced, although the Soviet Union had the advantage in Europe, and the United States kind of had the advantage when we speak from a global force power projection perspective, right? And then the Soviet Union saw something very strange. The United States was getting very weird. It was starting to exit this mutual suicide pact, and the United States was trying to develop what the Soviet Union was calling the independent conventional war option. The United States was looking for a way not to have to use nuclear weapons to beat the Soviet Union, but to actually engage in an independent conventional war with the Soviet Union without it necessarily escalating to nuclear war. Where back then, most people assumed that conflict between peer great powers, particularly nuclear powers, the conventional part of the war would last maybe two, eight, ten days max. But nuclear escalation was sort of assumed. A tactical level and a theater level, and that would lead to, to strategic nuclear exchange. All right. So, and, and uh, what they were following was essentially the development of long range precision guided weapons, and what they believed to be essentially a new way of warfare, right? That uh, what the United States was developing was a way to uh, engage the Soviet Union with conventional weaponry that could have strategic effects. What came out of a lot of those conversations in the early 1980s was essentially that, okay, conventional weapons 
which were really overmatched by nuclear weapons to the 60s and to the 70s, were coming back and they were taking back their space in war and in great powers thinking about war, particularly the Soviet Union's. And, and what they were thinking was that conventional weapons would become equal to tactical nuclear weapons and tasks, ranges, and target set. That you could now penetrate well behind the line of battle, hit counter value, hit critical objects in the country's homeland with conventional weapons. And this led to a shift of tactical nuclear weapons and Soviet strategy more towards what we call intra-war deterrence or escalation management. It has different names in terms of conventional weapons. And a precision weapons facility engagement of the country through the entire depth, right? And they were particularly focused on the utility of conventional cruise missiles into attacking command and control, nuclear infrastructure, and that these weapons could have similar effects to what tactical nuclear weapons were assigned to do in the 60s and 70s. Right? And of course, the logical assumption in Soviet thinking was always their strong predilection towards the, believing the United States intended some sort of first disarming, decapitating strike, and that the United States was going after surprise or preemption. Right? And that's a very strong confirmation bias, born out of a lot of long-running conservatism and pessimism in the Russian military circles. When I give those talks, starting from World War I, we really talk about the impact on military thought and strategic culture from Operation, Operation Barbarossa, June 1941, from which Soviet Union intellectually, in some ways, almost never recovered, and it's very relevant for us today. And I'll give this one point, even though I'm not going to go back to uh, the Great <coughs> Patriarch War, which is the belief that the Soviet Union would not agree to find an fight another large-scale industrial war a war based on material attrition on its territory. And it would not let itself be surprised by an attack like that by a technologically superior and conventionally strong power again in Europe, right? And so a lot of that thinking has bled over and it's just as relevant today as it was back then. That's one of the enduring continuities in Russian military thought. So so you know all these great ideas and it's going to have this arm race for conventional warfare and to see if we actually have a war with the United States positioned for such a conflict in 1980s. And so you indicted the peak of its technological might, as we all know, right? 1991, which is good because actually both both superpowers were working on the way to see if they could position their forces to have a conventional war with each other. And the Soviet Union was beginning to think that actually it was possible to have a conventional conflict without necessarily leading to nuclear escalation. I'm making these points because they become, become very relevant down the line when we get to today, because this is the origins of current Russian military reforms. Is the origins of Russian military thought. These people, Marshal Agarkov, who's put position here in the center, Chief of General Staff, was considered to be one of the, perhaps the brightest Chief of Soviet General Staff that they had. See, and he had intellectual children. And those intellectual children, also in uniform, went to the 90s and 2000s. And their intellectual children carried out military reforms and modernization process, and in many ways created the Russian military that we know today. Now, he's not entirely the father or the influencer or the shaper of it necessarily, but it's a strong influence, and the challenges they were dealing with today are very much salient and just as relevant uh, from back then. Okay. So, let's talk about 1990s. So, Soviet Union collapses, more accurately, dissolves itself. Soviet forces, all the best forces, are forward deployed in the warship pack countries. They return back home, they don't even have bases or camps for themselves. Some of them even deploy, frankly, into fields, right? Because Soviet military was a military with a strong standing force in Warsaw Pact and a large mobilization potential in the Soviet Union, right? So these forces returned back, and Soviet Union, the Russian inherits a large percentage of Soviet Union's conventional military forces with a really tiny fraction of the budget. This military quickly starts to fall apart in terms of any operational readiness or combat effectiveness that they might have, and you start to witness in the 1990s a very rapid and dramatic collapse of Soviet military power. Plus, of course, Russia quickly deals with a lot of problems that the Soviet Union has, and I'll cover them briefly, sort of the, the enduring problems the Russian military has dealt with, which is sort of the genetic inheritance from the Soviet Union, and that the military reforms and modernization process were designed to help address today. And they start first and foremost with hoarding. The Soviet Union had a pathological hoarding problem, particularly in the Navy. The Russian Navy immediately rolled off like over 75% of assets it inherited from the Soviet Navy. It just had a garage full of stuff, dated, obsolete stuff. It liked to have lots of numbers on paper. But as I often tell my colleagues and fellow analysts, Excel spreadsheets do not fight, and lots of things on paper do not translate into combat effectiveness and actually being able to effectively win a war. Second problem was diversity. Diversity is very good in a lot of things. It's terrible when you have diversity in platforms. The Soviet Union had lots of different platforms for the same mission and had lots of different platforms to maintain the different platforms for the same mission. Had diversity in everything. So you had like five main battle tanks just by itself, right? If you look across Soviet platforms, huge problem what we call distributed classality. 
Navy good example, still enduring problem with Russian Navy today. Like to make two ships in every class, then make two ships in another class, and two ships in another class. Why is the problem? It's a nightmare to maintain. It's a nightmare to upkeep. It's very expensive. It creates a mess. Next, and this is probably most important, blindness. Soviet, you know, Soviet military was a brutal model, in particular why? The Soviet military, in many ways like Russian military today, is an artillery army with lots of tanks. It is a firepower heavy army that uses fires to enable maneuver. Right? So it's a mechanized force that uses firepower to enable maneuver. And so it was very firepower heavy, but it had trouble seeing. It had bad vision. It was not very good at seeing things. So it could finish things really well, but it couldn't find and fix them. And it compensated for that by, one, having a huge amount of area of effect fires. It's called the close enough solution in war. Right? And having a lot of them. Right? And so Russian military, as I'll talk later, has worked very hard to try to solve a lot of these problems. But the uh, Soviet Union had an advantage. The Soviet Union had a huge conventional force. So it had the fires, it had the strike systems, but it wasn't really nearly that effective against things that it couldn't see. Um, and, it, it, and so these challenges really come to bear when we get to much more modern, uh, uh, modern nature of conflict today. Okay, and of course, last but not least, as always, um, Exilia mobility, which is, I'm from the Soviet Union myself. If you're from that part of the world, you're going to recognize something very, very obvious. Russia is about one eighth, one eighth the size of the Earth's land mass. There's a lot of land. If you're garrisoned anywhere in Russia, problem one is getting out of Russia to the point of conflict on Russian borders. Wherever you may be, you may actually start off thousands of miles on land separated from the fight. Even if the fight is on any Russian border, challenge one is actually getting all your stuff together and moving it all the way across Russia to the point of battle to engage in it, right? And being effective in that. Um, and so as always, agility, being able to move around Russia, get to the, pipe, get to the fight in time, is an enduring challenge. So, uh, 1999 is basically saw the worst of all of us, right? And Russia inherited this mass mobilization army designed to fight World War III, which was basically filled with cadre officer staff sitting on huge parks of military equipment intended to take in conscripts for this World War III fight, okay? And this military was completely useless for the new Russian state, because the new Russian state did not intend to fight World War III in the United States and NATO, at least not back then, and it was incredibly ineffective for regional local wars. Um, and the collapse of Russian military power became, came to bear. Russia saw basically what happened in the First Russian War in 94-96, and its ability to try to use military power in just armed conflicts or uh, uh, what they call uh, local war. So Russia participates to all, most of the conflicts of the wars of Soviet succession, right? Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Tajik Civil War, Chechen War in 1993, internal Russian constitutional crisis where tanks get used, second Chechen War, and even has the deployment to Pristina Airport, if you recall, back in 99, um, at the end of the Coast War campaign. A lot of Russian thinking really gets changed by U.S. Uh, Kosovo Air Campaign together with NATO allies in 1999. And it made, made Russian military and certain people in Russian political circles really begin to rethink the state of military affairs on Russia and their relationship with the United States. This lecture and this presentation is not about that. Hope those of you who follow Russia know what happened under the night. But it brought certain very obvious things to bear. Russia was overly dependent, in fact, entirely dependent on nuclear weapons as the grantor of a sovereignty, as the argument for status in the international system, and it's really the only thing it had left in its pocket because it had no conventional military power. And it's sort of coming up with different theories that nuclear weapons might be able to deter regional war or local war and whatnot. Here's a big problem with that. Nuclear weapons actually aren't good for a lot of things. They're not good for most things that people think they're good for. There's a really good professor here in Georgetown, he's a good friend of mine that would disagree with me in that score, who thinks that nuclear weapons and nuclear superiority are really important to the settlement of the local crisis and conflict. Okay? But I'm very much on the other side, or I tend to be on the other side of that argument. So Russia very quickly figured out that, well, yeah, nuclear weapons don't really deter, deter local conflict. One, nuclear weapons are not a selling point to the United States. Immediately at the end of the Cold War, the United States worked very hard to devalue the role, utility, and status derived from nuclear weapons in international affairs. Why? Because we're a dominant conventional military power. So that obviously serves our interest. And so Russia saw that with nuclear weapons, you can't get much in terms of your interests, arguments for your interests, and that that status doesn't actually really give you much in international affairs after the Cold War and began thinking and talking about how to restore the, the conventional military's instrument of national power again. And we'll fast forward to Russia-Georgia War. So Russia-Georgia War 2008, ours. 
it just passed not too long, uh, not too long ago, the 10 year anniversary of it, was really the last war of the Soviet military. All right? It was the last war of the military that Russia inherited from the Soviet Union. What Russians did was they understood that this mass mobilization army could not be summoned to fight a local conflict for all sorts of reasons. Mass mobilization armies fought conscript soldiers. Soldiers tend to have families, parents, mothers. You can only summon them for a big national fight. It's a big political issue to summon an army like that. They created a permanent ready force, a mobile type force, to fight small conflicts. But that force also proved not really good. So effective, effectively, they had two militaries, neither of which was especially good or useful for the, the needs of the state. And so the last hurrah of the permanent standing force, a force cobbled together with little units from all these cadre, cadre garrisons spread across uh, Russia, fought in the Russia-Georgia War. Um, going into the war, the Russian general staff had already long debated and planned capital reforms for the Russian armed forces. They understood that the Soviet mass mobilization army was not effective, was useless, and had to die. However, they were deeply unpopular, okay, because they would involve a complete reconfiguration of Russian armed forces. Which are heavily staffed with officers. Officers obviously don't want to be cashiered, don't want to be let go, and there are lots of equities involved. And that resistance was always very strong throughout the thousands. In fact, Russian general staff had just started experimenting with change command structure and relationship in the Far Eastern Military District before the war began. So going into the war, they had plans on the books for the reforms. And then, as the war takes place, the war quickly reveals what everybody in Russian general staff long ago knew, that actually the military they have, uh, the sum of it, the whole, is a lot less than the individual parts. The Russian military could not at all work together with, with itself. It neither had the means, nor the organizational culture, nor the ability to fight effectively as a force. It actually did quite well against the Georgians. It's a whole separate, uh, whole separate conversation. But the Russian military achieved its objectives. It de facto defeated the Georgians in a matter of three days. It's a five-day war. The decisive phase is three days. And it's not a war between Russian military and Georgia. It's actually a war just between a few elements of the 58th Army in Russia and Georgian forces and the 4th Air and Air Defense Army. That is, the amount of Russian force involved in this war very small. Russian general staff intentionally paints this conflict as a terrible sort of outcome revealing all the shortcomings of the Russian armed forces for a very particular reason. They want to push through the reforms and they need the political weight and leverage to push them through because they're deeply unpopular. And so by October, literally two months after this war concludes, Russian general staff, to get the Ministry of Defense, comes out and launches this entire military reform process, which obviously they had on the books long before. And they use the war as the explanation to the public of, look, this is why we need to change. Okay. Before I get to those, talk very briefly about the kind of military thought inputs in 2008 into this, because I'm trying to fast forward from early 1980s to 2008 and what kind of drove the reforms and the modernization process. So first, realization that what's really important in conflict is correlation of not just forces, but forms and means of warfare, right? Next, the understanding that, okay, there's a real challenge. Russian military really excels, excels at planning operations. Planning operations, executing them, pausing, planning another operation. They're very good at fighting a force like that. And the problem was modern warfare, they saw that there no operational pause in conflict. It was really annoying for them. So they began to think, how do you deal with the pace of conflict where you're not going to get operational pauses? Next, modern war features persistent effect with depth of adversary lines. Russia had often leveraged, dependent, and used effectively depth. Well, there is no depth of long-range conventional weapons, right? And penetrating weapons, uh, uh, of this time period. So the big question is, what do you do when spatial distance disappears? And the initial point of the fight allows people to not attack your forces, but to go after value, to go after critical objects in your country. Energy infrastructure, communication infrastructure, lines of communications, all the things that people depend on, you can hit them at the very beginning of the fight. Why do you need to have a fight right on the line of control on the battlefield when you can go after the key things in the country itself? Um, and so, uh, you know, along this, of course, was the increasing realization of the need to gain information and superiority going into the conflict during the threatened period of war and particularly in the initial period of war. And that's just not, that's not about information warfare. That's about intelligence, reconnaissance, you know, electronic uh, warfare and the like. Um, and then a general assessment. So what is the modern way of war? Well, way of war probably going towards up until the 80s was still very much based on large scale industrial warfare and concepts of war based on the premise of attrition. I often have this whole conversation that 
Well, theoretically, if you just realize we're in a, we're in a prolonged interregnum of great power wars. Since nuclear weapons have been invented, we have no great power wars. That's a real big problem for a general like military theory on what the likelihood on what the next great power war will look like. People typically tend to fall back to the last great power war and what it will like. So big challenge is the kind of way of war had changed to 80s going to 90s, where the United States, from a Russian perspective, very clearly walked away from warfare and base of attrition and went towards a way of war that's best described as airspace blitzkrieg and decapitating strike. The United States rips apart its adversaries from the air domain, and then that's it. And it shapes the ground domain from the air domain. And that's a fight that's decided in the first couple of weeks of war. And it's very clear who's right and who's wrong. It is not a logarithmic path of material attrition. It is an exponential decrease in the adversary's ability to, to defend themselves and resist very rapidly. That is, after initial costs, the United States military can rapidly diminish the adversary's ability to fight back. And that's actually entirely the United States' choice, the pacing of conflict, right? When Russians saw us, they quickly understood that there's no point building a large land force if you can't answer the U.S. way of warfare, because you're going to be Iraq. You can be Iraq in 91, you can be Iraq in 2003, you can pick your choice which of these you want to be, but neither of them are good, neither of them are the right military model. Mm -hmm. And of course, look at modern character of war. Um, increasingly began thinking about the fact that, look, non-military methods have become quite effective relative to military methods. This is not at all a new epiphany, right? I mean, this has been an enduring character and feature of conflict since time immemorial, and typically military cultures and general staffs discover this as a massive epiphany to them about every 20 years, where they say, oh, oh, there's all this asymmetric warfare and political warfare going on on the battlefield, and there's all this composition, competition between great powers that takes place during what is tissually a normative time of peace, but is actually a time of confrontation. And so every 20 years, you sort of rediscover the discovered country and land on this intellectual terrain again. And then typically, people give it a new name, you know? Because in Kenneth's time, it was a memo on organization of political warfare in 1948. Here's a memo on organization of gray zone warfare circa 2000s, right? But we kind of um, deal with this uh, every generation. And so, of course, Russian military really arrived at two. For them, it was two an epiphany because they are principally a land army. They're principally land force general staff officers who think about the land force being decisive in conflict. And they began to really kind of change their minds about what was important, what was first in conflict versus what was second. They began to see that, okay, principal contest is first and foremost aerospace and the aerospace defense, not land force, all right? Second, that contesting the information domain is really important because modern warfare, precision really depends on access to information. Like to say, smart weapons need to be told smart things to them by smart people. Dumb weapons don't need much said to them, okay? In fact, you don't really need that super smart people running dumb weapons. But smart, intelligent weapons, precision guy weapons need a lot of information to be effective. Otherwise, they're not very useful. And so contesting the information domain and access to information is, is very important early on. And that sort of came out uh, a really strong focus and belief that the decisive period of war is the threatened and initial period of war. That's the period in the crisis running up to the conflict and what happens in the initial period of war. And the conception that after the initial period of war, there might not be any other period of war. That's all that, that's all that relevant. So entire belief systems based around large-scale industrial warfare, prolonged warfare in Europe, the uh, Soviet Union never signed up to this. The Soviet Union thought max 10 days before theater nuclear exchange. And Russian military today doesn't sign up to this. They think max a couple weeks. An initial period of war will be decisive, and then people will have to make hard choices okay, after that. Because they will see very clearly whether or not they're going to win or lose the conflict in the coming weeks. So this, I mean, that's the essence of that thinking. Um, what does it lead for us in general towards outputs? So, offensive concepts. We have organized conception around uh, strategic operation that integrate forces and forms of warfare. They tend to overlap and integrate. Uh, the goal is really focus on the adversary as a system. What does that mean? It means not in the business of material attrition, of systems on systems competition, fighting for domains, a lot of the lexicons you hear typically in Western military culture. It's not the goal. The adversary is a system. You can shape one of two things, ideally both. It's will to fight, assuming there's an asymmetry of interests at stake that favor you, or it's ability to fight. And that's what the United States shows that it does very well. It destroys integrated air defense, such that it's no longer able to resist. Then it begins can opening everything it can find on the ground, and it's typically done within a month. All right? I'm painting, obviously, with a broad brush here. And the Russian military understands this very well. 
that's about systems, it's not about material attrition. And the conflict won't last long. So the emphasis on targeting the adversary's will and ability to fight immediately goes to logistics, information, critical infrastructure, and a lot of things that are not necessarily military targets but are civilian critical objects that the adversary would depend on to sustain a war, conflict, and theater, or even get them. Next, develop recon strike and recon fire contours. In the Soviet Union, it was called complexes. This is a Soviet Union idea. A lot of ideas today that you hear in Russia, terminology, the all great ideas of the Soviet Union from mid-1980s. In fact, most of the weapons you see deployed today are actually all Soviet Union's mid-1980s ideas, too. The all ideas the Soviet Union had on the book before it died. The Soviet Union used to talk about recon strike, recon fire complex, which is basically to solve the blindness problem. How to integrate fires, artillery, and MLRS. Please stop me and raise your hand if I'm, I'm, if I'm using terms that uh, uh, multiple launch rocket systems. Okay, at the tactical level of warfare, things that happen in that 1,500 kilometer mark, how to integrate them, real-time intelligence, destroy the enemy. And then strike system at operational depths. When Russians say operational, they're talking about something between 100 and 500 kilometers, right? Which, if you notice, most Russian strike systems are in that range. Most conventional strike systems deployed across Russian military are in that 500 km range, right? And that is integrate ground-based strike systems, air-based strike systems, whatever you can, real-time targeting assessment and this whole kill chain of sensors to be able to hit things and actually see things that move. Um, and then, of course, defense and paying bill with broad brush, civil military integration and the total mobilization model, which is both make new decision-making mechanisms that is integrate military command with civilian authorities so that you're basically prepared for a large-scale conventional war. You're ready for regional war, you're ready for global war against the United States too. And so you have exercise will regulate your military authorities take over key parts of the defense economy and whatnot that they need, and your civilian uh, administrators exercise with them, and they're going to know what, where, in a time of war, they know where they fit into the chain of command. But more importantly, the concept that everybody fights, right? And the fact that the, you have total mobilization of the state during a time of crisis and a time of war. And then you have airspace defense. It's not just defense, it's also offense, but principally, as I said, problem one for Russia is the strategic importance of air defense and missile defense because it's a clear Russian understanding that, okay, and that's the job of Russian airspace forces. Why Russian airspace forces have the air force and the air defense and the missile defense components. If you cannot blunt and defend against the initial airspace attack by the United States, which is really good in the airspace warfare and has a huge amount of long-range standoff precision guy munitions, all right, if that first two weeks, the decisive fight, if you lose it, you don't have a really good conversation to be had after that. All right? So it's very telling. By the way, if you ask, like, how's that different from 80s? It's very different. So if you believe the early 1980s, operational maneuver groups would go in first and assault, actually, against NATO. So there were different, there were different concepts to 60s, 70s, and 80s. Sorry, I occasionally digress. Um, <laughs> but this history is really because a lot of times when we talk about Russia and somebody says, well, it's like the Cold War. Like the Cold War in D.C., nine out of ten times when that person says that, they mean 1980s. They mean a period of conflict from 1980 to 1989. The Cold War is not that time period. A lot of people saw that time period who were currently in senior military leadership. They were all lieutenants at the very end of it. It's a very important experience, but i got to be honest with you, it's like walking into the last five minutes of a movie and say, I saw this movie and I know what happened. <laughs> it had a really good ending. We won. So what about the first hour and a half? Well, I wasn't there for that. Cold War is actually three distinct periods of conflict, right? It's more like really 1947, 48 to 1969, the real hot and dangerous part of the Cold War, where the United States did not do well at all, okay? And the policy of containment is very mythologized in terms of its success. The United States and Soviet Union start like this after World War II, and they end up like that in 1969, right? So they actually don't do all that well. Then the period of detente from 69 to 79, which is where all the things that people say, the rules of the Cold War, we had rules. No, we didn't. We had no rules. All the rules started coming in in the mid-70s. First 25 years had no rules, agreements, understandings, and a lot of new weapons and technologies that people were playing with were highly dangerous, a lot of gambits, a lot of risk-taking, a lot of failed attempts of coercion. The rules start coming in during the period of detente, right, which is where the competition settles out a lot more in Europe. And then there's the final period of the Cold War where the competition renews, now structured under rules, and that's 83, 89, and that's 99% of the time the period of the Cold War here referred to in DC, and that's the one that we technically won. Okay? So, all right, but last but not least, getting past airspace defense, 
Fix the operational pause problem by creating uh, operational pause and conflict. How do you do that? Really interesting question. Create gut checks in pace of war. Does have clear points of escalation where you pulse military power against your adversary to create really differentiating points in conflict so you can have potentially a conversation with them. And there's different schools of thought on this, but they range from early on conflict, inflicting what people consider to be deterrent damage, to the some amount of damage that early on in the conflict would force the other side to decide that the risk is not worth for it, right? That the cost is not worth for it. And then later on in conflict, a much more focused set of strikes that are more like prescribed damage. Um, which is an, an, a, a, a real amount of damage that, that sort of creates operational pauses in, in, in the pace of the, of, of the war. Um, and really think through escalation management, as I said, Soviet Union basically began thinking the role of tactical nuclear weapons or non strategic nuclear weapons was to go to escalation management, right? And if you succeed in escalation management, interwar deterrence, you get something, you might get some control of escalation. How, how the probability is, of course, varies, and, and develop effective war termination strategies. I'll, I'll conclude this basic slide basically saying like modern. Theory of thinking a great power war is a basic problem. In order to really engage in that, you need to answer four questions, right? Deterrence of your adversary, war fighting should deterrence fail, escalation management because great powers are pure nuclear states, so at the very first briefing to your leadership, they will ask you how does this not result with both of our countries ending up being glass parking lots, right? No matter what the stakes are, what's your plan for escalation management so that this doesn't end in theater nuclear exchange and a strategic nuclear exchange? And the war termination, how does it end? That question comes up front when you're thinking about engaging a pure nuclear power. You can have a conversation about that halfway through Afghanistan or every year in Afghanistan if you like, but if you're thinking about actual war with a pure nuclear state, the escalation management question and the war termination question come at the very beginning because that's what you get asked. Now, of course, Russians have some answers to those questions. How high their confidence is a really good question, but it's a different story. All right, answers to modern character of war. So, deterring the adversary, first and foremost, during the threatened period of war, coming up with a whole set of um, forceful and non-forceful means, using different, different <laughs> instruments of national power, to shape adversary decision-making, first and foremost, so that they don't initiate the conflict in the first place. Second, of course, very early on in conflict, what does that look like? What are your options for inflicting some amount of deterrent damage against the adversary? With, with high end capabilities, by which means sort of long range conventional weapons, precision guided weapons, and what Russians generally characterize as non contact warfare. Um, and the role and utility of conventional weapons, remembering that Russian military thought believes that mass use of long range conventional weapons is strategic in nature, right? That mass cruise missiles are essentially strategic and they can achieve strategic effects, they can achieve effects similar to that assigned to tactical nuclear weapons from previous decades of the Cold War. So believing that this will have a real shaping effect and inflict real pain on the adversary. And the concept of strategic deterrence, which sort of integrates along this lines from threatened to initial period of war, the different things that the Russian state plans to do to fundamentally influence adversary behavior, right? Not engage in the material, material attrition fight with the adversary, okay? But to influence their behavior and to shape it. Mm. Now finally, uh, uh, only but not least, the various scalable nuclear employment options, right? Soviet Union always had a whole series of nuclear employment options in terms of theater nuclear strike, and so does Russia. From nuclear demonstration to perhaps limited theater strike to full-on theater nuclear strike, Russia retains a fairly capable and very modernized arsenal for theater nuclear warfare and fairly advanced means of delivery as well. Let me go a little fast now. All right, here be a little bit naughty. What are not Russian answers to modern war? that we read a lot about today. First and foremost, A to AD, yeah. called the Science of Angry Red Circles on the Map. We see them in a lot of articles, op-eds, whatnot. This is not what war looks like. A to AD is not a conversation on Russia. A to AD is a Western conversation about the West and the Western divestment in its own conventional capability to engage in a conflict with a near pure, pure conventional adversary. That's what A to AD is. That's what these circles are about. It's mostly the West talking about itself and its own concerns, principally, that it will be conventionally deterred by capabilities that the adversary bought, deployed, and thus to them. However, these circles are meaningless. That's not how aerospace warfare works. It might mean, it, it doesn't, it honestly, it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you about how many radars there are. It doesn't tell you about channels of fire. It doesn't tell you that if any of these circles detect a stealth aircraft or not. 
They're not composed of anything. Is that the detection radius against the, you know, a Boeing aircraft, or is that the detection radius against an F-35? Is the detection radius against an F-35 non-existent, right? Or could you destroy the entire system by wiping out, you know, 20 radars? You don't know. So it's a pointless conversation, and the whole A2AD concept means different things, really depending on what your capability is, right? Uh, Gerasimov doctrine. Well. Mark is a very good friend of mine, Mark Gilley. Gerasimov Doctrine was a clever thing he wrote on the blog after reading the summary of sort of Gerasimov's speech that was posted in February 2013 on Vipicat. Uh, he's a very good colleague. He never meant it to be an assertion of a doctrine. He's recanted it and taken it back. But it really became like a creature that escaped from his laboratory and entered the Russia field and has now sort of gone wild, you know. This notion that Valery Gerasimov, chief of Russian general staff and armored warfare officer, this brilliant political warfare theorist who's been coming up with these various doctrines and whatnot, um, it's not the case. Uh, they're very clear and enduring currents of Russian military thought that we can clearly trace evolutionary, right? From periods to the Cold War to today, and every chief of Russian general staff essentially expands and espouses these views, and they're not necessarily his at all. Uh, nor does any chief of Russian general staff have a doctrine. Because Makar before Gerasimov didn't have a doctrine. And Bayevsky before Makar, who was actually one of the leading military thinkers of the Russian military, also did not have a doctrine. And I can safely tell you that when Gerasimov ceases to be the chief of general staff, he's not going to take his doctrine home with him. All right? uh, hybrid warfare, uh, my views on that are very clear, publicly known. You know, I work with Frank Hoffman a lot. That was a really, hyper warfare and hyper conflict was a really good addition to the conversation in the mid to late 2000s. It was meant to be applied to something else. Uh, today in the Russian field, it's basically used to talk about whatever you want to talk about. So if you say I'm here to talk about hyper warfare, you then have to explain what you're really here to tell us, right? Um, and that's going to de-escalate. That is not an explanation of Russian nuclear escalation strategy or nuclear warfighting strategy. That is, again, typically a U.S. conversation about itself, because after 25 years fighting adversaries that don't have nuclear weapons, doing counterterrorism, counterterrorism, stability operations, and conventional wars against fairly weak states, there is this epiphany that nuclear weapons exist. And nuclear weapons are a pretty capable deterrent. And the people that bought the nuclear weapons might actually plan to use them. They are not like Christmas ornaments, right? And they actually plan to use them the whole time. As we start looking back to back in the Cold War, we find out that People were pretty serious about using the nuclear weapons, which is why we never did that fight, right? So, um, but I'll get back uh, to the topic again. Let's say military reforms, modernization, and, and I'll, I'll paint a bit with a broad brush and then, and then get us towards Q&A. So, military reforms basically knock down the Soviet mass mobilization army, massively consolidate it, and begin building out a permanent standing force, right? They consolidate all this equipment, they chaff a lot of equipment that's old, obsolete, write it off. The initial focus of military reforms in the principal period of military reforms early on is late 2008 to 2012. That's a tumultuous period. Officers get cut and reduced by substantially. Um, the, the, the permanent standing force that starts out is fairly small. Maybe it's around 650 to 700,000 standing. And, and the focus of military reforms is to create a force capable, first and foremost, of modern day conflict, which is based around non-contact warfare, right? And, and not having investment in large ground force structures and, and uh, land formations. Um, and during this period, the Russian, the Russian General Staff leaves the airborne as essentially the contingency force for any armed conflicts or local wars, right? But in case anything happens, the airborne will step in. But, but most of the military is kind of like this new uh, uh, piece of raw meat. The process is highly disruptive. There has a lot of critics, a lot of General Staff gets massacred in terms of being cashiered because they're all opposed to us. Uh, but it creates something really interesting. It really takes and reorganizes the Russian forces by district, which I'll show you in a bit, creates a very flattened command structure, the most flattened command structure Russian Soviet Union has had in a very long time. It reorganizes the forces in it and creates pretty good rationale for them. There's a number of crazy ideas that don't happen. Like initially they wanted to go from divisional structure to a light, medium, and heavy brigade structure, and they didn't do that. They just went to a brigade structure. And then later on they go back. Um, and there's lots of things that can move around to get broken. The like, dreaded Russian Spetsnaz actually gets almost completely ruined during the initial period of, of uh, military reform. The military leadership decides they're like, we don't need contract professional servicemen and Spetsnaz, they can be all conscript. And then they start moving around brigades and soldiers immediately leave when you start moving units around, right? So they basically ruined the effect on the Spetsnaz for a while and then started reconsolidating after 2012. But a lot of important things take shape here. And the most important takeaways are really are the establishment of first and foremost a permanent standing force, 
A plan to dramatically increase the contract share of the force, so the soldiers that take something like a three-year contract to serve, as opposed to annual conscripts. And that really takes off. I mean, that increases substantially in the Russian military from this time period to about today, probably for a total share of well over 50% of the Russian military today, but highly uneven, meaning in the Navy and the Air Force, it's much higher. In the Navy, it's probably more like 92 to 94% contract staff. And so most of the con most of the conscripts are really in the um, in the ground forces and other places where they serve jobs that don't believe are really required to have a lot of uh, extensive training or specialization. But in general, the Russian force today is probably majority contract staff. Um, and the establishment of things like Special Forces KSO, Special Operations Command, which which became more publicly known starting in 2014 in, in Crimea and in, in in Syria. And then, second process, modernization, which really begins, the big state armament program starts, uh, gets launched in 2011. It's not the first one. There are state armament programs before it that are much smaller and don't get implemented very well. But 2011 begins the real recapitalization of Russian def defense sector and the launch of a state armament program. Back then, it was 20 trillion rubles. It was valued in those dollars of 670 billion. These numbers are meaningless. Actually, these are all the good numbers you need on Russian defense spending going back then and actually looking forward. And you can see it's not going down by much, it's actually going up in some areas. And, and the sector uh, share spread of defense spending. We see that Russia as a middle income country can afford to spend on defense procurement modernization more because their force cost them less than a high income country, which is basically almost any Western developed country, right? And they have huge purchasing power parity because they buy from the soul. When you hear dollar amounts, immediately fold them out because they're useless. Russia does not, Saudi Arabia does not buy US F-16s, right? So, what does that money add up to? Well, when we budget 20 trillion, which is about what both state armed programs are, most of the budget is backloaded fancy numbers. Up front, it's about 30% what they really plan to procure and spend. And the program is revised every five years. So what it really is, is a five-year defense procurement plan for the Russian Armed Forces. Of this, about 13% goes to nuclear forces and nuclear force modernization. So nuclear force still have a strong priority in Russian military. Um, beyond that, you can see how the split comes out. This is just a defense order. When we stack, add the right numbers here in blue is below it, what we get is a probably around 3, 7, 3% GDP being spent on overall military expenditure. This is if we take Ministry of Defense, but then we take pensions, then we take, you know, Rosguardia, MVD, FSB Border Guards, Key Sword Repair Military Security Service packed together. It's kind of called the NATO standard for military expenditure, how, how SIPRI meshes. So base defense order is probably around 2.8% of GDP, but you typically stack around 800 billion to a trillion rubles almost onto that. What do you buy with that? Well, pricing power parity is quite high. I mean, realistically, for really bad rough numbers, you could give about two and a half multiplier to this, which is that if somebody tells you that Russian defense budget in today's dollars is about 50 billion, then it's pricing power, given that the Russians are buying from themselves, it's probably about maybe 150 billion, if not more worth of hardware. Which explains to you why they can afford to have all these things. Because whenever people tell you Russia's defense budget is only 50 billion, and you look at the size of that force in a nuclear force, you might wonder how those numbers add up. And they end up very clearly, the 50 billion number is irrelevant, it doesn't matter. And most of this is quite sustainable, actually, in terms of current very anemic economic growth and the rate of defense spending. Right? The, the percentage of GDP they're spending on defense is pretty sustainable looking out, and you can see the budgeting here straight through 2020, 2021, keeping it at around ish. Uh, 3 trillion rubles per year. Um, this program bought a lot like for the Russian military. It recapitalized airspace defense, tactical aviation, rotary aviation, um, had big big ticket items, obviously submarines, had huge problems too, shipbuilding programs, a massive lagger. There are big uh, areas that where the defense sector itself needed to be revived because it had basically been starving and living off of exports for two decades. The biggest problem Russia went into, got, uh, got into the modernization program was the divorce with Ukraine's defense sector in 2014. These were symbiotic defense sectors. All right? In fact, the Russian military actually never knew how much of its defense spending went to Ukraine because Ukraine was a big component supplier of engines and various important things for the Russian defense industry. So 2014 came this really sudden and rapid divorce and it set a number of Russian programs five to seven years back. Right? Key areas, gas turbines for ships, some things Ukrainian still were sold to Russians, helicopter engines, but Russia had to replace a substantial percentage of Ukrainian production and, and basically develop uh, native analogs. Now you'll talk a bit about force structure posture changes. 
which is what Shoigu comes in with Gerasimov. They inherit the sort of raw, undercooked uh, uh, military that's reformed, but not really bloodied, and no one really knows necessarily how they use it yet with new command structure, and uh, begins to implement a program of training, snap readiness checks, exercises, to essentially start forging this force and expanding it in size. And so this force basically starts to grow. It grows probably somewhere towards 850 to 900,000 strong today in that ballpark. The contract size of the force dramatically expands year on year. When Gerasimo comes in in 2013, he sees what he inherited. He says, here's the problem. This military now has equipment, it's ready to go, it has real soldiers manning it, they're all here. But in an actual conflict, in a crisis scenario, what these people know how to do is they know how to get their gear, go to the training range next to their base, and do some practice shooting, and that's it, and put on a piece of military theater. And he says, this is the next evolution. We will do snap radio checks, we will do training, we will do exercise. The point is to take that military and to get to a place where on short notice, people can fall on their gear, they're ready in the garrison, they can load it to a rail hub, they can transport it thousands of kilometers to a point of conflict. They can unload it in a part of Russia or an area they've never been in before, right? And they're ready to actually go into combat. Their commanders are ready, they have the command and control, they have the communications, they've trained, they've exercised, and they're able to complete that entire sort of chain, right? And to be actually combat ready, but more importantly, that this is a combat effective military, right? That this is not just a garrison military that all it does is practice outside of its base when the, when the commander or senior military officer shows up. And that's what I've been working on since 2013. And what stuck 2018 was sort of a five year in review. Of, of how well the Russian military performs in all those tasks and the, the amount of progress it has made. Um, Russia's gone back from brigades, in some cases, to recreate divisions in key areas where they feel they will need divisions, and has started playing back and forth with force structure, as always. In the Russian military, things change all the time. So there's a lot of times they do something, then they change it, and they change it back to how it was. Then they change it back halfway to how it was between point A and point B. And so point C is somewhere along this. And so every couple of years, the force structure of the relationship change. It's very common for Russia. Um, I overran my time a little bit. But the main influence from the two wars. So if Russian military began to be bloodied, both in Ukraine and Syria, Ukraine drew some lessons for ground force formations and the need to recreate divisions in key areas. Most of the new divisions are being created around Ukraine, not all. Um, and it's basically more of a test lab for not non-contact warfare, but contact warfare. The traditional fight that the Russian military knows and understands very well. Artillery fires, armored mechanized warfare, um, and looking at ground force structure. The second thing it's a big test bed for is for indirect action and the use of non-military means cyber warfare, information warfare, non-conventional warfare, the sort of things that you would like to be able to use against the United States in a high-end conflict, but you cannot test against the United States, but you can test against Ukraine, right? And to see what's possible, because the escalation dynamics are nil. And there have been a number of these types of attacks that have actually had splash damage, because cyber warfare obviously is not very neat or clean. Syria is the transformative conflict for the Russian armed forces, by far the most important one. That is the training pipeline, not just for Russian Air Force and Aerospace Forces, of which more than two-thirds have been cycled through. It is a training pipeline for all senior officers in the Russian military. Military district commanders, armed commanders, division commanders, combined arms army commanders. They all go do three months rotation in Syria. That's where they get their combat experience. Um, we can talk about that. But it's a fundamental transformative conflict. Even though it looks like an Aerospace Forces fight against, you know, um, uh, uh, basically low-tech forces with, with really no, uh, no potential for escalation. The reality is that's not how the Russian military sees it. First and foremost, the Russian military, this is principally a conventional conflict against a, a, an adversary of limited means, but it's a conflict where they're not there really testing, just testing equipment. It's where they're trying to make things like recon fire, recon strike contours actually work. It's where they are working on combined arms and jointness that is getting different services to work together. It's where they have deployed the communications technology for the units to work together, but quickly found out that aerospace forces don't necessarily want to work with land forces. In the Russian military, the land force is it, and everybody supports the land force. And if you don't know that you support the land force, it's because you, you're obviously born in the wrong military. The US is principally an aerospace and maritime expeditionary power. Russia is a land power. The job of air power and sea power is to support the fight on land led by land forces. 
So there are big organizational culture problems as well because just because you just because you create technology for people to work together doesn't mean they will. Doesn't mean that air commanders will all plan air operations around ground operations. The Russian military found that very quickly in Syria. But just because they can't doesn't mean they will. You have to actually break them of, of uh, service culture. And then the most important part of it: observing U.S. coalition forces gathering tons of information. You know. Uh, uh, database on aircraft signatures, interacting with fifth generation stealth aircraft, looking at electronic warfare returns, radar returns, observing how the U.S. does cruise missile strikes, what it looks like, changing, adapting, nice observing the United States, actually learning a lot from Israel. Israel is a tactically brilliant air force and does a lot of strikes right next to Russian forces. And Russian forces watch them very carefully to see how Israelis perform, how they act, what they do. So they draw, get a lot of lessons not from bombing to you the Hewitts. Okay. They get a lot of their lessons from watching their interaction with coalition forces and Israeli forces. That's what they learn a lot about. The big question, what does cruise missile defense look like? What does aerospace attack look like? What does Russian aircraft performance in the sky? What can it see relative to a U.S. fifth generation aircraft, right? Where else can you get this kind of experience? Where else can you take it back to modify systems? All right, close out with the last two short sites. So lingering weakness is our main problem. Key areas of weakness, defense industrial sector, Engines, main key engine systems were all made in Ukraine. Chips, actual electronic circuitry, um, and materials, right? Heat resistant materials. This is a big problem whether it comes to aircraft engines, jet engines, or hypersonic boost glide vehicles where you need a super, obviously, heat resistant tolerant coating. So um, these are traditional challenges. And, and Russian defense sector is good in some, but definitely weak in others. They're enduring problems. But engines in particular. So that delayed shipbuilding, it delayed a lot of programs. And there's a lot of basic things that they didn't have a native domestic industry for, for that engine, which the Soviet Union itself did. Even things you wouldn't think of, like drones. Best engines of Russian drones are like from Japan, right? Because they're not, they're not necessarily a light engine industry in Russia to actually put into a medium range drone, right? Um, the radiatory diseases that I covered earlier with you, right? Uh, here, Russian military has done pretty well in making good advancements on blindness, although still a continued issue. While those range circles and arcs are showing you are completely irrelevant, because it doesn't mean that the adversary can see anything in that circle, especially if it moves. Buildings don't move, but forces generally do. One of the first things Russia learned about problems in aerospace forces, so they, they, they bought about 400, maybe 18 fixed-wing tactical aircraft, between 2011 and 2017. One of the first things they learned is that they, not only did they lack precision guide munitions because they didn't invest in them, but as a whole, the Air Force could not hit maneuvering formations. And so that very quickly fell to the job of, of uh, rotary aviation, the helicopters, right? The Russian Air Force really needed people to sit still, ideally, and had to drop lots of unguided munitions on them. And when people were attacking forces, they could not counter maneuvering formations. They didn't have the munitions. They had way huge amount of overkill. They didn't have the ability to hit a moving target with precision. They didn't have the ability to hit move, small targets either. All right. Um, Limited ISR infrastructure, they're obviously working through us, classical Russian solutions, a lot of organic things, disposable drones, short range, medium drones, rather than building a giant vertical ISR stack uh, like the United States does. Um, that said, that remains to be, that remains a, an enduring issue. Air power is a laggard, of course, Russia's a ground force first, and Russia affects. Uh, air defense and the air denial from the ground, and if the Russian Air Force shows up, then the Russian military is really happy, but it doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, munitions, precision guided munitions, well, you know, as the adage goes, quantity is a quality of its own. In conventional warfare, quantity and magazine depth in precision guided munitions is very important. It's not necessarily as important maybe in theater nuclear warfare, but it is very important in conventional warfare. So being able to fire a caliber cruise missile is great. It's another great weapon system from mid-1980s. Question is, how many do you have? And will you be out of them by the third day of war? Or the fifth day, or the seventh war? Because right? the United States has a lot. Has a lot. So if you want to get into the exchange of long-range conventional fires, you need to have numbers. You need to have a large number of munitions. Uh, well, last but not least, of course, reserves. So when the Soviet nationalization army was killed, the permanent standing force was created. The Russian military debated the creation of the operational reserve for it. And had a mod, basically sort of a, a prototype initiative program to develop it. And they talked about it, and they talked about it, and they talked about it, and they're still talking about it. All right. So the biggest issue is they have a territorial battalion reserve to defend Russian territory. They don't have an operational ready reserve necessarily yet, meaning not established, 
to replace losses, attrition, and, and war. And that's important, because the United States does have actual reserves. Um, the rest is, of course, stability of contractor base, the expansion of the contractor force has really slowed down. So they're about where they are today. That's still really good, and that's quite a few contractors, right? If we look at the, the share of contractors, the conscripts, and the force, but they can't really get beyond this, and they're sort of looking to a goal of about 425 to 450,000 contractors in the force into 2020. And too much money on Dr. Strangelove programs. Insanely scared of missile defense, looking out 20, 30 years, and spending a lot of money on technological programs like Poseidon, the artist previously known as Status 6, uh, strategic nuclear power torpedo, like hypersonic boost glide vehicle programs to counter missile defense, like Booty Via Snake, nuclear power cruise missile, which is actually our idea from the 60s. A lot of these are ideas from 50s and 60s, the early period of atomic age. They were too crazy and kind of ahead of their time back then. And, and Russian military has gotten back to, to revisit some of them. Okay, so this is kind of my general split uh, in terms of conceptual how I think of it. Contact warfare is much more focused on local conflicts, wars like Georgia, Ukraine, really about imposing will on your neighbors and your abroad and being able to engage effectively in course of diplomacy, diplomacy backed by a credible threat of force. Non-contact warfare is really a conversation about us. Deterring the United States, showing the United States that you can impose real costs in the conventional conflict in the initial period of war, that you have a clear vision for escalation management, right? And of course, all sorts of other means that we typically bracket as asymmetric or, or whatnot, but it's basically indirect warfare, indirect action, right? Which you can employ during a threatened period of war, or could be a very useful corollary, corollary sort of supporting element to an actual conventional conflict. Uh, I apologize, everyone, I overran my time, but I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I don't know how much time I have. Um, half an hour left. Brilliant. No, and I'm happy to stay here longer, if we're allowed. So, um, Without further ado, sir, back there. Um, so this wasn't really covered by your um, look at the Russian military, but if you look at the Russian military doctrine, there's language about color revolutions and internal subversion. Based on your research and people that you've talked to, is this a, is this a, a genuinely held belief in the Ministry of Defense, or is this kind of just like a top-down imposed by the presidential administration with the defense ministry kind of nodding its head along? No, the, uh, no, the Ministry of Defense and key thinkers in the Russian military generally believe in us. They believe that the United States way of war right, is to de facto engage in political warfare early on, mm -hmm. then state-sponsored irregular warfare, and then leverage its privileged position in the international system to put pressure on the state, and then only in latter phases come up with a sort of pretext for an actual conventional intervention. Now, the political leadership, particularly intelligence leadership, believed in, believes in this hook, line, and sinker, right? And the conversation in Russia is driven very much by the political leadership, and a lot of political leadership are principally, or at least more national security elites, many of them intelligence, in particular counterintelligence elites. Um, so they generally believe in us. In fact, if you understand actually Gerasimov article from February 2013, it's not his article, it's clearly written by a couple different colonels. It's not actually an article, it's a summary of a speech, a speech that the chief of Russian general staff gives every year at the beginning of the year to the Military Academy of Sciences, right? So every general staff comes up, gives us a, a speech of, these are modern outlines of war, here's what I think about it, here's the problem set. His speech was really long, the title of it was like 30 words maybe, and so they summarized in an article called The Valley of Foresight Prediction. And he's written many articles since then. So the military general staff's goal was really to explain something that a lot of military struggle with and all chief of general staffs really have to do. It's getting trillions of dollars in military procurement modernization for a large conventional force and nuclear force designed to engage in non-contact warfare against the United States and classical conventional contact warfare against Russia's neighbors, right, and local conflicts. The principal problem set that the Russian political leadership sees is U.S. information, political warfare, subversion, and the ability to essentially slowly disintegrate the state and challenge the stability of the regime without use of force. Mm -hmm. This is the problem. This is what he's in charge of. He gets a lot of money to be in charge of. How does he connect those two? Mm -hmm. And there comes this brilliant expose. Here is the understanding of U.S. way of war, and based on how we observe the United States operate in the Arab Spring, 
Here's what happens during the threatened period of conflict, and here's how the United States uses all these means in confrontation. Here's the phasing. Here's why non-military means are so important. And it says the its whole point of the article is basically, look, I understand we're basically armor and artillery officers, right? Which she is. Um, but that the, the Russian military gets it, that it has answers to this problem set, and he's trying to link what is very actually difficult to link. Mm -hmm. Which is why does Russian military, who gets submarines, aircraft, helicopters, and nuclear weapons, how is that going to help solve the principal problem seen as this box by the political leadership? And that's the whole point of that article. I mean, all military leaders write this kind of article, and their three main points are basically one, he was new, he's only been, he's only been chief general staff for, for three, a couple of weeks actually. Yeah, and, and they, they kind of tend, to, sorry, but they tend to go along these lines, which is basically to explain that the Russian military gets it to send the signal back, mm -hmm. right? And second, to say, hey, I'm the chief of general staff, and like all chief of general staff, I'm a thought leader, right? And I have big thoughts about warfare. These are thoughts that have long been written down before me, but they're my thoughts, I'm now in charge. You know, and, and three, of course, uh, I get it, but I have to link what we offer to this problem set. But the short answer is, do they actually believe this? Yes, they do. You know, one of the most fascinating things that archives opening back, I think maybe 15, 20 years ago, really revealed during the early period of Soviet Union under Stalin. You sort of like the real dark empire, uh, totalitarian state period. It turned out, believe it or not, that the people in charge of the Soviet Union, the communists, were actually communists, and they actually believed the things they said. <laughs> and it's important not to be too cynical and not to tell yourself that these people just say these things, they don't actually believe them. A lot of them actually do believe it. Mm -hmm. They really do. And they're at a certain point in their career, time, and age where they're not impressionable. Mm -hmm. So any Intel analyst, who some of you may be or may aspire to be, I can safely tell you, if you think you come into the room and you sit down with Vladimir Putin or Nikolai Petrushev, and you tell them that, no, you don't understand, actually it's like this, and they're going to listen to you and say, oh, thank you for your brilliant vision. You know, I never thought about this. I was only in charge of FSB in the 90s and been running this country for over 20 years longer than Stalin. It had never occurred to me that I might be wrong. It's really good, really good thoughts. Right? I mean, so, do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen back there? Yeah. Uh, speaking of intelligence, uh, I, I was curious, uh, before 2012 versus after 2012, how was the role of GRU, Russian military intelligence, uh, uh, changed as far as battlefield preparation goes? Battlefield preparation goes? Or, or anything, really. <laughs> okay, so uh, speaking of intelligence, and, all right, it's a great question. A while back, I mean, GRU actually got downgraded to sort of GU in terms of uh, its significance and access, but I think really has gained a more prominent role, in, particularly in Western conception of it, um, once the confrontation got ignited after 2014, right? So two things. One, first, there are actual combat formation in the Russian military, like Spetsnaz, right, that have GRU next to their name, and that simply signifies that they have dual reporting structures, right? They're a brigade. In fact, many of these units are, are detachments that, not in the brigades, but they're Spetsnaz detachments that are assigned to basic maneuver brigades, motor rifle brigades, right? So the question is, who do those people answer to? Do they answer to the jury? Not really. In any combat scenario, they answer to their commanders, right? They're not going to be somewhere in the field calling all the way, way, way back to headquarters. Their job is to be reconnaissance, to be a sniper team, to do targeting, to do diversionary operations. And, you know, the way Echelon works in Russian military, of course, is you have military districts, in time of war, the military districts have a Joint Strategic Command, right? So that Joint Strategic Command is the nerve center, and its job is to feel, operational thinking military, taking forces, feel them along the wide front. That Joint Strategic Command underneath it has combined armed armies and air and air defense armies and fleets, right? And underneath those, there are divisions and brigades. And so, there are all these people that technically have a GRU next to their name as a unit, but in reality, they're going to be answering to the brigade division commander who force generates battalion tactical groups and whatnot, and they go forward with them, or they may answer slightly higher up, but they're not going to spend most of their time calling all the way back to GRU, right? So that's from, just from a practical military standpoint, because there's sometimes I think a little bit of a sense that, you know, special GRU are some kind of military intelligence ninjas, Actually, they're not, and the ratio of contractors to conscripts in those units isn't that high to begin with. Um, they're, really, uh, they're really elite infantry whose principal job is recon and support of conventional uh, operations by combined arms formations. That's their, that's their number one job. Hmm.
a force of military intelligence? It's gaining increasingly prominent role in the general confrontation with the United States in operations against states like Ukraine, uh, particularly early on, and in various uh, pretty aggressive operations um, against the United States and members of NATO. And it's very competitive because Russia, I mean, I've argued over time in some articles that the principal Russian approach is much more emergent, it's less deliberate, it's much more suitable to that system. And it employs a lot, Russia employs a number of parallel or sequential approaches. The process is highly competitive. These intel agencies step on each other's toes all the time. They sometimes ruin each other's operations, which is not common. Mm -hmm. And the thinking behind it really is that a lot of the things being done are exploratory and that the state is looking to put resources behind those approaches and those parts of the organization that show or indicate that they're actually making progress. And the way, the way in many ways you think it comes together best to describe is that vertically it's a pretty integrated system, but horizontally it's not, all right? Hope this makes sense, all right? They're basically, um, uh, they're basically these silos of not just agencies, but essentially um, best to describe. I like to think more of Russia as, as, a, as a modern day or a latter day court system with clans and factions, right? And basically informal rules and large patronage networks. And these people, you may think, they execute orders of one person. But of course, Russia doesn't run this way at all, right? The leader of Russia doesn't wake up, get into a control room, and suddenly pull knobs and, and levers and dials. It's very much, uh, 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 if not ad hocracy, but um, a state where Things are not centralized and not necessarily directed in that manner. And a lot of the people of different factions, they actively fight to shape what the policy should be. And what they typically tend to do, in many cases, is they try to create facts on the ground and then sell them to the leadership for approval. Say, see my approach, what I've been arguing for, that's a successful approach. You should sanction, put resources behind what I and my agency am doing, right? To try to shape the political leadership. So I know that's a very incomplete answer. For the record, I'm not an expert on Russian military intelligence. So. This is the best I can do. I've spent a lot more time on Russian military itself and armed forces. No, thank you. That was very helpful. Yep. Gentleman back here. Yeah. So I guess my question is, we hear a lot in the news about the different types of strike systems mm -hmm. Russia's developing, but not much about missile defenses. So it like so is Russia playing, or like would they consider doing something like the U.S. is proposing the you know missile defense review, like you know, putting lasers on drones or things like that, or are they more prioritized on strike systems to prevent advances in U.S. missile defenses? No, so um, Russia's probably one of the most advanced countries when it comes to air defense, right? And air and missile defense. Some parts of missile defense are, of course, naturally very hard. Missile defense in general is very hard, uh, both cruise missile defense or ballistic missile defense. But Russia has quite a number of systems deployed. The best way to think of it is that the Russian thing on uh, air defense and missile defense is about integrating the key things you need. You need the radars, right? You have your land-based radars, you have your strategic radars, one. Two, you have air power, you have your airspace forces, which integrates the air force, so you have the air component of your air defense, people that can shoot down cruise missiles, for example, or do queuing. Right? Then you have your land-based forces, people that do actual air defense that have the radars and the missiles. There are principally two things, two types of air defense in Russia. There's the maneuver formation air defense, because Russian military moves like a hedgehog with lots of Short range point and medium range air defense that's quite effective. High kinematic missiles, a lot of systems with them, right? It's very heavily armed in terms of short range medium air defense. Pretty effective on its own, right? Uh, the air defense we typically talk about where all the angry circles come in is the air defense, air defense owned by aerospace forces. The S-300 PMU-2s, S-300 V-4, more missile defense oriented systems, the S-400s. Those are meant to be well behind the lines, right? They're much more strategic systems that provide air defense for the theater and defend critical objects in Russia, too. And they're kind of split in terms of how they are operationally assigned, who commands them, who takes care of them, and feeds them. So most of the angry circle complaints are about those systems that don't even talk about the air defense that actually tend, typically comes with Russian ground forces. For Russia, air defense, missile defense is fundamentally strategic. And it's one of the big questions they will ask themselves in the initial period of war, whether or not they can actually sustain the fight against the United States, right? Whether it's worth negotiating, whether you can create an operational pause, or maybe the only possible answer is nuclear escalation, right? And that makes sense, but they're heavily, heavily invested in this and very advanced in particular in this department, right? Um, 
And if you seem to actually spend a lot more time on air defense than you do on air power for the purpose of air superiority. The Russian military and general staff principally want to fight air power for strike systems and bombers, tactical bombers. Why? Because the land force only question is, what does air power do for me? And when air power says, well, I'm going to have this great dogfight, you know, Su-35S will go against F-16 or F-15 and, you know, there'll be Top Gun music in the background. The general staff says, I don't understand, this is really fascinating, but what, how does that help the land fight, right? Your job is to do cruise missile defense, your job is to blow an aerospace blitzkrieg, and your job is to do bombing and strikes in support of land forces, right? And that's why a lot of the main programs they tend to fund are things like Su-34 and, and, and tactical bombers, and much less so air defense, which is the right thing to do. This is the dominant air power, right? We're heavily invested in that, so it's not competitive to chase the United States in air dominance, air superiority, not at all, especially if you're working with a lot less money. Okay, I'll try to give a shorter answer, more cogent answer. Uh, next question. There's a lady in the back right there. Yes, uh, how do you see the kind of military value of the conscript army developing? Or is there a possibility that Russia could move on to using only contract army? Uh, I think there's no possibility they'll move on to using only contract army. I think there's a clear decision there to keep a percentage of conscripts and to keep the conscript rotation down to probably around 220,000 per year. And they're actually approaching that. They're probably maybe 250, 240,000 per year now in terms of conscripts they actually need. Uh, but the overall approach was first, change structure and incentives. So starting last year, they begin to offer conscripts the choice not to do a year of conscript duty, but to sign a contract actually for two year service in the Russian military. The point of conscripts in the Russian military was really twofold. One, military exposure early on and then try to pick them up on their contract for three years at the end of their conscript term, right? So if they see the military, they see that, hey, it's actually not a bad life, you get a lot out of it, and there are pretty huge benefits to being in the Russian military. And Russian military went in terms of status in society and prestige and people's view of it, respect for it, from like down here in 90s and 2000s to up here, right? It's one of the much more respected institutions today. And, and although it still has a lot of problems, it's a much more cleaned up institution compared to anything 10 or 20 years ago. Conscript's really role is to provide key support for services where you're doing a lot of specialization because let's be honest, you don't really need to be a cosmonaut to drive a truck or to be a system mortar lord. And there are a lot of positions in Russian divisions or formations that aren't necessarily staffed, they're not staffed at 100% for simple reasons because those positions are really only necessary in high-end conflict, right? And, and you don't need them for most scenarios, and when you will need them, you can easily fill them. You can either potentially get reservists or other people to fill that position. It doesn't require much training. Um, why keep conscript, conscripts around? Okay, there are always big problems, right? Iron Triangle, do you invest a lot in capability? Do you invest a lot in the size of your force? Do you invest a lot in the readiness of the force? You cannot have all, right? You cannot have all three things be amazing at the same time. It's pretty challenging uh, with financial constraints. So Russian view right now is that they have a good enough percentage of the force as contract, and it's contract in the right places. So if we look at air power and naval power, we see a lot of contract servicemen where they need to be. Okay, if to balance between having money for the actual capabilities, but more importantly, they're spending pretty crazy amount, if I go back to that chart I show you on readiness, on readiness. Like the Russian military is more ready, I think far more ready today for conflict than the 1980s Soviet military ever was. The reality is in terms of operational readiness and exercise, they're spending a lot more money on that. So it's a conscious choice and trade-off. My sense is that they have no intention to make the military contract only, that they expect to have small percentage concepts. It's much cheaper, it's more effective, and it's more affordable to balance these different needs. I hope that makes sense. As far as combat effectiveness goes, you know, this is the base in Stein Memorial. Um, we, because we are tactically a brilliant military here in the United States, we tend to be very chauvinistic at the tactical level of war when we look at other militaries, and we think that conscripts are inherently not as good. Which in some ways is true, but intellectually take this always with a grain of salt. I'll give you two things. Does Israel have conscripts in its military? Yeah, it does. Would you expect Israeli military to just run in the fight? Probably not. There are huge differences amongst the level of conscripts and conscript militaries. If you look at most of our great power wars, in fact, all of them, World War II were fought by conscript militaries. All of them. But some conscript militaries in that war were very better than other conscript militaries. So all conscript militaries are not made the same. Some of those conscript, mil conscript militaries were tactically way better than the others in those fights. Hope that makes sense. So right there. Um, I, kind of on the flip side of that, how deep is the Russian officer corps, like the, the leadership? Are we at a point where we have kind of like a, an old guard at the top and, and no one to replace them? Or are there efforts to make sure that those are also federal? 
kept, kept as deep as the contract, if that makes sense. You know, the Russian officer corps? Yeah. The Russian officer corps is probably, I don't know, about 220, 230,000 strong-ish, painting uh, broad numbers here. In terms of how deep it is, I mean, it doesn't have any problems. It's probably the best training, most combat experience officer corps Russian military has had in some decades. All of it's rotated through Ukraine or Syria, particularly Syria. All of it goes regularly through exercises. A lot of people near the top now, when you kind of look at their credentials, their credentials typically say Second Chechen War, maybe Russia-Georgia War, maybe Ukraine, but for those who weren't in Ukraine, certainly Syria, at least on three month tour of duty, some twice, which is important because three months on operational staff planning in Syria is nothing like 10 day strategic exercise that you do once a year. These are night and day in terms of what you learn from those uh, as a commander. So in that respect, it's actually pretty good. I mean, I, and of course, we're comparing Russia against Russia. More questions? And so I was like jumping all the way in back. Uh, how is the training levels in terms of things like pilot flight hours or maybe days at sea and that kind of things? Sorry, pilot flight hours, and what's the second one? Uh, days at sea. Uh, for oh, days at sea. Okay, great. So, let's we'll start days at sea. That's been going up dramatically. If we look at, in general, Russian service combatant force operations or, or submarine operations, I think both were down in a real near year in early to mid-2000s. Um, the Russian Navy was pretty badly funded and didn't spend a lot of time in operations besides sort of flave the, wave the flag exercises and, and port of call visits. So, days at sea, live fire exercise trains have gone dramatically. Look, it's, it's, let's first talk about what Russian official then puts out. Most Russian official statistics are complete nonsense, right? We call it kind of true lies. That is, it's, 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 a, um, uh, it's a dramatic, it's a dramatically exaggerated figures the way they like to count. What's real is that you really do see a tremendous amount of money being spent to increase the number of flight hours people get. If you look at tactical fixed wing aviation, a substantial percentage of it has rotated in terms of crews to Syria, and rotary wing aviation too has spent a lot of time there. If we look at sort of the massive difference of allotment between mid 2000s and today, it's probably several fold increase in flight hours. Time at sea, the same, probably a bit uneven in terms of different types of ship crews, and also in some cases obviously put stresses, because here's the thing when you, when you pump that up, when you increase it, for the system, it then takes some time for maintenance operations to catch up because people are working at this pace, now they have to work at this pace, you're gonna have accidents, you're gonna have problems, and they're gonna be visible, right? And that actually took place, you saw a lot of that in the Russian Air Force in 2015, for example, um, where maintenance had to catch up to the dramatically increased uh, sort of hours and time spent in flight operations, some combat operations. But I hope that makes sense. So, substantially improved. Actual figures and numbers, mm, it's hard for me to give you because most of the things they put out are true lies, right? And, and I give a substantial discount to anything I, I hear. I'll give you a good example. Um, one of the early slides of picture of showing you looking at this map, and it's an annual geography test that they're all doing. We kind of giggle because about two years ago, no, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, Shoyu comes out and he says, listen, Russian forces and the Russian-led coalition liberated Syria, and they successfully liberated 500,000 square kilometers of terrain, which is a really good number. And then we looked, and of course we giggled because Syria is only 187,000 square kilometers, right? <laughs> so, this is a very good example, but when we apply the same statement to Russian pronouncements on number of sorties in Syria, Russian pronouncement, of course, on critical objects hit, uh, from Jabal and Nusra and ISIS and Oman Syria, they all dramatically exaggerate figures and numbers, right? That's sort of these sort of true lies. So there's, there's truth there in terms of combat effectiveness and what they've done, but a lot of nonsense as well and inflated, inflated figures. Yeah. Sir, back there? Yes. Uh, so if Russia sees itself strategically attacked, you know, simultaneous color, color revolutions in like Kazakhstan, Armenia, or mass precision strike uh, on, on targets of interest, what non-nuclear options do they have to respond to that defensively? Ah, well, so having basically reforged a fairly effective now, more proven demonstrated uh, conventional military that's a useful instrument of national power, which Russia didn't have for a long time. In the 1990s, it was considered to be either ineffective or unpredictable, right? With, with often leading to uh, considerable political costs when it came to using in conflict. Now you can see 
that in many ways, Russians return its traditional strength, which is, as, as historically sort of weak but enduring great power, Russia's weakness had always been in terms of the economic foundation of power, and its strength has always been in terms of the military foundation of power, and it could be, at many times, used one to compensate for the other. So now that the military is back, and it's an effective instrument, they like to use it a lot. It's one of their best arguments. And to be honest, my personal view on international relations is use of force remains the trump card in international relations no matter what anybody tells you today. Right? So what is the answer to that? Russia has a force that can generate a very substantial amount of fighting power on short notice today. It can deploy it to Russia's borders. It can airlift a small percentage of it. Airlift's a weakness, but fine. Um, it can intervene in conflict Central Asia Caucasus. And the Russian military is strong enough today to de facto beat any of the former Soviet republics. Uh, and actually have a pretty decent chance of taking on NATO in the initial period of war, too. So that's the long and the short of it. And in terms of mobility, if it's an armed conflict or a crisis to respond to, Russia actually does have the mobility to deploy on short notice, obviously the airborne, um, but it can deploy a small amount of force. And people really sold it short in terms of the capacity for expeditionary operations heading into Syria in 2015. And Russia showed that actually the barrier to entry could have much lower than people think, and the ability of a force to intervene and dramatically shape the outcome of a conflict and, and the correlation of forces with what is really, I mean, let's be honest, it's a mixed-wing aviation regiment with a tiny force protection element and a ground force that was, a, that was able to, to change Assad's forces in that conflict, show what you can do with a fairly limited amount of military power. And, and so it's very much there today. I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and they've worked very hard to create, most importantly, to work on the logistics and infrastructure to be able to affect a rapid response to these different types of contingencies from our conflict, Russian phase, armed conflict, local war, regional war, global war. So just to clarify, that would be preferential to any kind of a, a, a nuclear use for uh, a perceived strategic aggression. And nuclear weapons are for us. Right. And China. Hope <laughs> that makes sense. How are we doing on time? Uh, just for one more question. All right, one more question. Sir, right there. Uh, my question is a little bit shifting gears. Just in general, on military analysis, um, if you were to say have to shift to, okay, somebody asks you, for example, um, uh, I want to understand the, the the Chinese military. How would you go about that from A to Z? Oh. Just in general, you know, like. Basically, training future right. analysts. How would you go about that? What would, sure. what would be the? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Um, okay. It's an inter. It's an interdisciplinary profession, right? So you need to put a couple things together, and you need to work on a lot of them a little bit at the same time, right? That adage goes: it's difficult at first, but everything's difficult at first. So, first and foremost, you have to marry two aspects. And, and if you have both of these, you, I think you'd be quite successful in D.C., right? Being a functional as expert, that is, you're, you're a product of a strategic studies program here in a strategic studies community, to understand key aspects and elements of warfare, right, and of strategy, right? and be a functional expert on something, develop that expertise one bit at a time, conventional warfare, nuclear warfare, these sort of things. Because it's important to know how things work, why they work the way they do. And second, of course, work on becoming an area studies expert. There's an expert on the country who's forced your study. That means you need to know a little bit of the language. It means you need to first map out what the best sources are. Then you need to map out what you need to track on day to day so you stay current because there's always an amount of information coming at you. And put a part of your mind you got to commit every day, right? The people who are the best expert in the field, why are they the best expert in the field? They spend every day, the job is their hobby and is their passion. It does not work for them, okay? I'm not going to say that because they will find out and stop paying me if I told them that I would do this for free. But that's the reality of it, right? That if, I, if they weren't paying me to do it, I would still do it in the evening when I come home. So you have to be into it, you have to like it, and then start building those resources, start reading them every day. And then, as you're, as you're looking at what you're reading and starting to learn more about it, and you have your foundations, your background, IR theory, strategic studies, right? Various aspects of warfare, you start to think big thoughts. And then you become dangerous because eventually you might start writing, right? That's the best outcome. That's ideally the best outcome. So that's where you have to go. Uh, my advice is always, if you want, first and foremost, if you want to be an area studies expert on Russia and China and whatnot, you should pick up some language skills. 
It's essential, it'll help you a lot. Other experts in your field might not take you seriously if you don't have them, to be frank. There's a great deal of chauvinism in that department you need. However, being an area expert on a country or on a particular problem, to me, is just once, basically it's, it's uh, only, only a part of the solution to what you need to know and what you need to have. You really need to have functional expertise and you need to be able to think big thoughts about warfare, how it really works, why two A2AD A2 A2 circles aren't necessarily representative of the problem set, right? And, and to, to understand conventional warfare or counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, and those things. And that all takes time to pick up. I right. hope that makes sense. My favorite answer is always history. History is really important. Eventually, you get to history. And it's really frustrating in any field because the more you read and learn, the more you find out how much more knowledge is out there, right? And it gets really annoying because you begin to think, am I ever going to have enough time to read all those books and to learn all those things? And why can't I get it all now? And, and, but don't worry, most people I find in the field have that very same problem set and struggle with that very same frustration. But history, I find, is very important to problems of today. All right, I hope this was good. I hope this was useful and interesting.